Let me thank you all for being here. It's so nice to be in the same room. Um, thank you, Maria Grazia, for uh, organizing this. It's been a long time we didn't see each other, so it's uh, extra special. And thank you, Ilaria, for connecting us and, uh, and inviting us. Um, a little bit about ourselves. Uh, Franco and I were born in Italy, uh, quindi parliamo anche italiano, and we live in New York City. And uh, this is our website, 01001011011101101.org. Like <laughs> this is how an exhibition of ours looks like. The work usually inhabits different distribution systems, including the artwork, like galleries, museums, biennials, etc. The surface internet, our website and social media, as well as more obscure places like the dark net. If I had to sum it up in one sentence, I'd like to say it's about how information technology influences the way we relate with one another. In this sense, we believe that our screens are like um, are less like windows to other words and more like mirrors that reflect how our word functions. We get a lot of inspiration from cultural phenomena that are specific to the internet, and we try to emphasize that aspect rather than the artist's own originality. We like to make explicit um, where the works come from and where they go, and how fundamental the role of the viewer is in this process. An exhibition of ours might feature hand assembled computers infected with a virus uh, we wrote, a computer virus. Sculptural recreations of internet memes. Projections that are wrongly placed and wrongly shaped. Webcam videos on large monitors. Sometimes installed in atypical arrangements. Old computer ruins scattered across the floor. Long cable tray installations that wind around the exhibition site. Office desks. Hiding videos. We actually produce a lot of videos. Uh, they are usually shot with webcams or phones, neither with proper cameras, um, or they are screen grabs. We usually adapt the video, uh, we adapt to video genres that are internet natives. For example, reaction videos, supercut compilations, a montage of short clips with uh, the same theme, weird viral videos, makeup tutorials, virtual assistant chatbots webcam pranks, video game trolling, or photo slideshows. While the same video can also be projected in cinemas, or watch on someone's phones adapting to the shape of the distribution system. We started when we start <laughs> when we started making art in 95 uh, we were 19 years old and we had all these uh, radical ideas about art uh, but we were isolated living in a provincial town in Italy uh, far from the epicenter of the art world it was uh, very frustrating but right then the internet started and suddenly we could overcome our problem we could make art from home without the need of intermediaries, the so-called gatekeepers of the art world, curators, dealers, journalists, whom we did not know. Some artists were starting to publish their works on the internet, but they used the, their websites and portfo as uh, portfolios mainly, uh, posting photos of uh, paintings and sculptures. Well, we thought that the new medium called for a new art. And so we started experimenting with a new art that could only exist on the internet that could only be created and be seen there. 
In other words, an art that was uh, medium specific, not art on the internet, but internet art. Until one night in Ljubljana, Slovenia, uh, when we met Vukčosic and found out we were not alone. Uh, there were at least uh, six other <laughs> artists working on that quest. Uh, and Vuk had even invented a term to define the kind of things uh, we were trying to do. Net art. We were doing it mostly for ourselves and uh, a few other sleepless artists scattered around Europe and Russia, whom we deeply admired and followed with absolute devotion, although we had never met in real life. And then suddenly, from a niche avant-garde movement, it started growing and growing and kept growing. Uh, so six artists became 16, then 60, then 600. Uh, then the biennial started inviting uh, museums, become commissioning works, and some dealers noticed this new art. One of the things that attracted us to this new medium was its complete lack of history. Uh, unlike painting or sculptures or video art for that matter, uh, you didn't have to deal with tradition and previous masters. Uh, everything needed to be created from scratch. We wanted to make an art that wasn't like anything else we had seen before. But at the same time, it was a big challenge. Uh, since the medium was completely new, we didn't have a history to study, artists to follow, or, or professors to learn from. The internet for us was an almost utopian place, uh, but as we all know, that will radically change over the following years. One of our first work was um, called Life Sharing and started January 1st, 2001. It was commissioned by the Walker Art Center in Minneapolis. For three years, we openly shared our home computer, making its content accessible on the internet. All our artworks, as well as private materials, including emails, texts, photos, and bank statements, were freely available for viewing through our website. It was our personal computer, and we were, you were physically entering a very intimate space, as if you entered someone's house and you started picking through the drawers. Viewers had real-time access to data, sometimes even before us, for example, if I would check our emails, um, like this one, while we were asleep. There was no user-friendly interface. In addition to accessing everything, people could also copy anything not just the content, but also the tools and the system that made it run. Social networks didn't exist at the time, and personal data was not a currency yet. On live sharing, you couldn't buy or sell anything. No ads, no cookies, no data mining, pure sharing. A lot of people have used uh, sexual references when uh, discussing the work, especially voyeurism and exhibitionism. Hito Scharer called it abstract pornography. In fact, there were very few images and videos on our computer because smartphones didn't exist. So the focus of the work was definitely data rather than bodies. And I'm not sure how this slide relates to what I'm saying. Life sharing probably anticipated the extent to which the internet and social media have become a mesh in our self-image. With the passing of time, you become hyper self-aware. The dream of complete accessibility turns into a nightmare of self-design to correct, to adapt, and to contradict this image. We unplugged it in 2003 when it became such a nightmare. It came with the realization that social media, on social media, you don't share. You are a share. It the, it's the internet that shares you.
once a video of ours was uh, removed from YouTube, uh, we were very surprised as this was the same video we exhibited in museums around the world. So we started looking into the process. Uh, how does the removal function? Uh, is it a software? Are there guidelines? And we discover the hidden world of internet content moderators. We discovered that the removal of content is not undertaken by sophisticated artificial intelligence, but by human filters. People disguise these algorithms. They sit in front of monitors all day long, often through the night, sucking up the worst that humanity has to offer. Uh, pornography, hate, torture, beheadings, in order to decide what can stay and what should disappear from social media. After much research, we managed to locate a few moderators and we persuaded them to be interviewed. Um, and we turned each interview into a video episode called The Bots. Several actors reenacted the interviews from home, uh, filming themselves using their phones. It's kind of the nature of the job. You don't have to take it seriously. I mean, you have to be professional, obviously, but it's just the nature as opposed to being super serious because it's like you're in the training and suddenly there's like a penis on the screen or Trump with like an anus for a face um you know it's like good morning here's the penis good morning let's talk about children being molested online or like good morning here's a head being decapitated when entering the exhibition you only see these gray pristine surfaces they look almost like modernist sculptures but when turning around them, you realize they are desks, uh, customized office desks. To tell the moderator stories, we have borrowed the aesthetics of fake makeup tutorials, which are sometimes used on social media to bypass censorship of controversial topics. So, in a sense, it's an art piece disguised as a makeup tutorial. And all the videos can be freely watched online on uh, this.art, dis.art. Personal Photographs is a network of cable trays that winds around and throughout the exhibition site. This one was installed at Team Gallery in Los Angeles. And this one at Fondation Fi in Montreal. At the two ends of the tray are two Raspberry Pi uh, microcomputers. All the photos we shot in a given month, for example, September 2009 or January 2012, are in constant circulation within the cables. The images are pulled from our personal archive of digital photographs of the past 20 years. In this sense, the work is connected to live sharing, uh, I was mentioning before, but this time the images are invisible. They're images without viewers, yet always there, like most images nowadays. This is a screenshot of September 2009. The installation is made of uh, cable trays Produce, produce industrially. It's an infrastructure that usually is uh, invisible, and in this case, it's made very present in the exhibition space, concretizing the otherwise abstract flow of information and power. The vast majority of images nowadays do not exist in the form of printed photographs, if you think to it. They are not hung on a wall or featured in a book. They instead exist as ubiquitous files being constantly copied and transferred between devices from a data center to another through miles of cables or through thin hair. In this sense, this display, this is the display of contemporary images in its most common form. This is installed at a photo museum in Winterthur, Switzerland. And this is the Kunstverein Wiesbaden in Germany. And this one is installed outdoor for the first time. 
in and inside, inside and outside of the exhibition space on the facade of CO in Berlin. Speaking of viewers, um, Ceiling Cat is a sculpture based on an old internet meme. Uh, it's a taxidermy cat uh, peeking through a hole in the ceiling, always watching us watching it, attractive and scary at the same time, maybe like the internet itself. Ceiling Cat uh, created to show it's not a photo, it's a, an object, a thing, a cat. The sculpture is based on an image we found online whose original photographer is still unknown. Uh, it's a very popular image that circulated virally and generated endless variations, becoming a meme. Memes are internet native images that rely upon people's creativity to produce new versions by remaking, remixing, or imitating the original one. So a single image cannot be a meme, but a part of a meme. One manifestation of a group of images that together can be described the meme. Here, for example, are a few versions of Ceiling Cat. Uh, memes defy all art parameters. They are created collectively, they are anonymous, they spread virally beyond any control, and they are free. Photos of our sculptures are now starting to circulate, uh, becoming entangled with the other versions. So the work coexists in two different circulation systems, the art world and the internet, in constant negotiation between image and object. In this way, the ending of an exhibition uh, marks the beginning of the image. After the San Francisco MoMA acquired the work, we made an agreement with the museum to give up ownership of the photo so that anybody can copy it and use it for whatever purpose free of charge. And you're welcome to download it and use it. Speaking of copyright. <laughs> like uh, this person, for example, who is printing it on a dress and selling it for only 49, 49 euros. Or this guy who made a Pokemon card. Uh, so just to be clear, we have nothing to do uh, with these images. We just found them randomly online. Thank you.